grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God our Father, and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. This part of the church year we call Epiphany because it grows from the East, from the Christmas season until the beginning of the, of the Lenten season in preparation for Easter. And after the Christmas, when we have celebrated the, the uh, birth of the Christ child, what the whole lessons about Epiphany uh, <coughs> tell us is that Epiphany comes from the words which means to show forth, to manifest, to make known. <coughs> and so in these texts, particularly in the Gospels, we see that this Jesus, the baby born in Bethlehem, was not just a baby boy but he was also God. And in today's text, we see Jesus as he is uh, healing the sick and uh, casting out demons and uh, for the whole town's worth of people. And, and only God can do that. Uh, you have some charlatan uh, preachers who uh, uh, fake those kinds of things. And uh, there was a time when he used to say that 85% of the uh, ailments that people were in the hospital with were uh, psychosomatic. In other words, it all came to the mind. Well, those people are, are prime people for faith healing. Uh, so if you just convince them that they convince their body, as Paul talks about in the, in the epistle lesson today, you know, keep your body under subjection. You can make your body do what, uh, you know, if you thought before you were sick, well, so let's make it well. Let's do that. Okay. Now, sometimes God chooses uh, to make that happen uh, when it's according to his purposes. Uh, but a lot of times, it's just fakery. And as people, you know, the, uh, particularly if you go to any of those kind of faith healing services and, and people, uh, you know, throw away their crutches and get rid of their wheelchairs and if you knew the truth, says they didn't have them before the service anyway, uh, you know, because they're setting people up for that and to, to convince people that they could do those kind of things. But Jesus didn't, didn't need to do that. He could heal them. And, and this was on a, uh, a special day for him. We put it in the context of, of his ministry. Uh, this was the day that he had spent a major part of the day uh, preaching to the people the Sermon on the Mount. And then as he's going to, to Capernaum and so forth, uh, uh, he's healed some others. He healed, the, I think, the uh, servant of the centurion. Uh, he healed some other people. And uh, then he went and, and uh, uh, had a Bible study at the local synagogue. And then he uh, went for supper at uh, Simon and uh, Andrew's house. And uh, two other disciples were with him. And uh, as they got to the house, the, uh, Simon told them that his mother-in-law was ill. And uh, so Jesus then went to her sick bed and extended his hand to her and lifted her up and uh, said immediately the fever left her. And then, hmm. you ready ladies? Did you hear what she did? got off her sick bed and went and served the people. Crazy lady, huh? All right. But she served. She served willingly as a part of her role, as part of what she expected of herself. She did that. Jesus was doing, even though he was God, he was also man, which gave him some limitations. And he then, uh, after he had uh, healed her after dinner, by the time dinner was over, all the sick of the town gathered together outside Simon Andrew's house. And so Jesus then, after all of that long day of work, he then continued as to go out and heal all the town that were brought before him. And then they went for rest. But before this, and it, that probably took a long time for him to God, touch each of those people <clears throat> to bring them healing in accordance with his will. 
But the next morning before the sun came up, Jesus went out to pray by himself. To be in dialogue or to be in prayer to his Father in heaven. Uh, And as he was out there, then Simon and the others noticed that he was gone. And they go all over the place looking for him and found him in that desolate place and said, uh, uh, we got a whole other crowd at home uh, waiting for you to come heal them. Jesus said, no, let's go into another town because I came to preach. And so he went otherwise to preach his message of the kingdom of God is near, repent of your sins and prepare the way for the coming of the Lord. Same theme of the Old Testament as in the New Testament. That's still the central core of all of it. Repent of your sins. Repent. Uh, and I don't need to tell you that. Okay. <laughs> uh, so he was is, is going to preach around, and he did then continue on into Galilee uh, and, and preaching, uh, preaching his sermons and, and telling the people uh, what he needed to tell them. Uh, then the people of the Old Testament of Isaiah's day, uh, see, they had a problem with uh, uh, endurance. Endurance in the faith, endurance in the worship and praise of God as their creator, as their provider, as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Uh, and that's why it begins off, you know, O Jacob, O Israel, same guy. But it, it, it really nails it down when they... they they look at Jacob, that was before his name was changed to Israel. But, uh, uh, but they were beginning to lose faith in God because they didn't see him acting in their lives the way they expected him to do. The people who came to Simon and Andrew's house after dinner came because they expected Jesus to heal them. No less were those who came the next morning to be healed. They expected Jesus to heal them. Those who came in the evening were healed. Those who came in the morning were not. Why? Because it wasn't according to God's purposes that the second group be healed at that time. Doesn't mean that they weren't healed at another time, but not yet this time. So, the people of Israel had had not seen God's activity amongst them. Their faith had grown so weak that they were not able to see God's hands into their lives and what they were doing. And so they were complaining to Isaiah about this. And And he said, you know, Have you not heard? Have you not seen? What's wrong with you people? Open your eyes. Do you not know? Can you not see what's going on? You know who you're dealing with? This is the guy that laid out everything. Created everything. Is above everything so that we look like grasshoppers. Actually, it probably looks like even smaller than sands of the sea or something like that. But it... uh, uh, But... You know, they didn't know about seeing things from space. Anyway, but he, the whole process is that, don't you know who you're dealing with? And oh, by the way, God does not get tired. God is always at full strength and full power. God does not always choose to use his power for what you think it always needs to be used for. But God uses his power for what he wants to use it for. Because he has a much better plan. He has a much better perspective on what is needed here. Our job 
is to continue to trust Him that He is in charge. And that sometimes we're in the evening heal, heal group, and sometimes we're in the morning not heal group. Sometimes God chooses to answer our prayers for healing. Sometimes He chooses not to. Because He has plans. He has purposes for the healing or the not healing. Uh, comes to mind, I think, of, of one of our folks who uh, was diagnosed with terminal cancer and would only live about another five to seven years. Uh, that was over ten years ago, I think. And uh, he's still hanging around. And he is still witnessing to the love of God. And he's writing about his experiences and keeps adding new chapters to his book. So those of you that I've handed a copy of it to, uh, come see me. He has a, a new edition. All right. Because God did not heal him, cure him. God chose for him to struggle through great pain, which was not only a struggle for him, but for his family as well. It's not fun for anybody. And so as he's struggling through this and, and continues to live and to witness through all of that struggle, that was God's purpose for him. We, we can't always understand why God does what he wants to do. His, his ways are totally incomprehensible to us. But Jesus, he continued to preach the word. Paul, in talking about it, first it talks about, you know, he's on an endurance journey as well. And, and uh, his whole journey, his whole concept, you recall, changed in direction uh, when Jesus confronted him on the road to Damascus when he was fighting hard for his Jewish religion, fighting those upstarts of a heresy called Christianity, or the followers of the way in that day. And he was on the road to Damascus when uh, uh, Jesus confronted him in the voice and said, Saul, that was his name then, his other name, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And Saul says, well, who are you? And they have this little talk and uh, things. And uh, it didn't change the physical direction that Saul, we know him as Paul, as Saul uh, didn't change his geographical directions. He could have left his GPS on the same uh, bearing. But, he, uh, but it changed his whole purpose for going that way. It changed the whole rest of his life because God had need of him. And after a few years, as he begins to read all the Old Testament uh, texts about the promised Messiah, and he sees that, that they were all in infinite detail talking about Jesus of Nazareth. And then he begins this race that carried him to the, to the palaces of Rome to the Caesars and his household staff, and all in between there, and eventually to his death as a martyr. He ran the race. That's why he's talking about being on the race. It was that you know, being a Christian is like running a race. You know, as I talked when I was uh, in college, uh, high school and college, I, I ran track. I was not that good, but I ran sprints, and it's not easy to get this much weight going that fast, that quick. So I, I, it came to at least, I gave me time to work up to the uh, quarter of a mile and go around the track once. Uh, sometimes I could do that fairly well, at least faster than some other guys that were running at the same time. But uh, being a Christian is not a sprint. Being a Christian is not a you know, 13.2 marathon or a 26.4? Is that what it is? Six? Oh, it's 13.1 and 26. Point, uh, no, no, no. 
I got up to the 13 decade ago, and, uh, and that was it. But the, uh, Paul was on a, a lifetime run. It was a lifetime run. And, and unfortunately, too many people who become Christians, either as infants or later in life, they don't understand the commitment. If God is going to take care of you from now through eternity as His child, there's an expectation that for the rest of your life in time, you're going to be His child and act like it. God expects you to live a perfect life. He expects you to be perfect. But the problem is, we're born of sinful parents. We too are sinful. So we don't like, we can't handle that. But as we are in touch with the Word and Sacrament, the Holy Spirit renews us. Renews our faith. Renews our strength in God. And He does that oftentimes without our even knowing it. But uh, uh, in, in a sporting event, you know, and the coach, usually particularly with team sports like basketball and football that we see now, not so much football, but uh, basketball. In a team sport, the, a, lot of the, a lot of the output of the, of the players depends upon the coach's ability to hit the right chord, to get their energies excited and coordinated and get their adrenaline moving uh, and, and, and back into the game for the second half or back in the game if a timeout with about 20 seconds left and you're only two points down. It's, uh, uh, you know, that's, uh, that's a different kind of adrenaline. And, and they know that they can put out because in another, uh, let's see, 30 seconds, it probably won't take but about another five minutes to complete that time. But... Uh, and in, in, in football, it's even longer. But, uh, uh, but being a Christian is a call to be God's evangelist, as God called Paul. And it's a lifetime commitment. It's a time, and, and in the church, you know, as we get together and, and we talk about those of our congregation that are marathon runners. As they come and they get involved and they stay involved uh, their entire time at, at Messiah or at any congregation, and they're involved with those works. I, it's, it's amazing how when I go back and visit congregations that I had been uh, uh, a part of before or, uh, or were aware of before, and uh, 15, 20, 20 years later, 30 years later, they're the, the same people are still serving as in the leadership of the congregation. These people we call marathon runners, but it's not a limited time. The only limit to it is your death because they understand their commitment to Christ and to His people gathered in worship. And so, you know, and, and so with, with Isaiah, we ask, you know, do you not know? Have you not heard? Have you forgotten? When you think sometimes that God has abandoned you, have you looked real closely as to whether maybe you have actually abandoned God? That your eyes have been closed to what He is trying to do for you and with you as His child? How often we, uh, we blame God for things that aren't going the way we think they ought to in our lives. We get angry with God because it didn't work out. We get upset because of uh, things that are going on in our life. Uh, the finances, which is always a roller coaster kind of thing, uh, finances are not going well. Uh, when, when personal relationships get, get disruptive and, and uh, uh, marriages are, are in... Uh, uh, in a destructive mode. You know, it's, it's, it's painful. It's, it's, and 
And we ask God, we, as Christians, we're in prayer during those times. But when it's not resolved the way we think it ought to be, we're just not happy. And our eyes begin to close. Our openness to the power of God is cut off. And we stop losing, or we stop gaining, or receiving, we cut off His Holy Spirit. And uh, it's... Uh, that's, it's what was the story? I'm trying to remember the story, but there was... Uh, God often lets us uh, wander in our agonies so that we get really deep down and no place to go but looking up. And sometimes He does that so that we finally look back to Him. And then He lifts us up, just as Jesus did Simon's mother-in-law. And the fever of sin leaves us again, and we again become renewed children of God. That's what he calls. We're running this race. We're running this race, and there's only one winner, and that's Jesus. But the rest of us are in the race because he's leading it. And, and, and we're part of the race. And, and as a part of that race, we want to bring crowds to see the race. We want to bring the crowds to hear about this Jesus that is the leader of the race. We want them to become runners with us. Runners with and for Christ. That's what He has called upon us as His children in baptism to be and to do. Can't do it our own. We have to be, by God's grace and power, in connection with the Word and sacraments, studying His Word, in connection with His people, in helping one another to meet our challenges, because whatever challenge you're meeting, someone else in the group has faced it before, and they can commiserate with you and help you see your way through it by God's grace and power. God has the power. He chooses when and how to use it. You give thanks to God for all the good that He has given to you. You also thank Him for all the evil things that He has permitted you to happen to you because it's through those things that He has strengthened you and brought you closer to Him. So we can thank God for the good, the bad, and the ugly, but we can't blame Him for the bad and the ugly. That's because of sin. But He takes everything, and for His runners, He makes everything, the bad and the ugly, good. To His glory and the furtherance of His kingdom. And by the way, your race, the race that you're running, it only lasts until death comes. And then you get your eternal crown of glory. Not the kind of crown that you know, the runners run. In, in Jesus' day, they got these little twiggy things that uh, after a few days it faded away. Today they get huge statues and MVP players get a car and all sorts of stuff. No, nothing that permanent. But what we as runners in Christ's race, we have crowns in heaven. And when, we, uh, when death comes upon us, Jesus reaches down and takes us from our deathbed and takes us into Himself for eternity. Till that time, may the peace that that understanding gives us keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus until He comes to grab our hand and take us to Himself.